have been keeping my wife in your prayers. Uh, she is recovering nicely. For those of you who don't know, she had her tonsils out, uh, which as an adult is harder than as a kid, I understand. But uh, she is doing just fine. She's managing the pain. Unfortunately, the pain meds make her a little loopy and uh, walking and she's been bored. She's gone through all of our receipts, so when tax time comes at the end of the year, we'll be able to do that. She's got all our Christmas cards taken care of. When the boys photo album, so if anything you can do laying in bed, she's you know, found it some way to stay busy, to keep herself busy. Uh, so thank you for your prayers and thank you for the food. Um, I have been losing weight up until about a week and a half ago. Um, so your generosity has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, today, it's Christ the King. Christ the King Sunday. Happens every year. It's the last year, or the last Sunday of the year. So, Happy New Year. <laughs> Next Sunday, on the 27th, is not the first Sunday after Thanksgiving, but it's the first Sunday of Advent. We don't have a Thanksgiving holiday built into our uh, church calendar. We have Advent beginning, and that's part of the holiday season. I look forward to the holiday season, to Advent coming in the same way that the stores look forward to about a month before Halloween, when they start putting out Christmas decorations. Isn't it a shame? Um, but, all that worldly stuff aside, part of our church calendar is to keep us in the rhythm of the faith. We, we have marks of discipleship that we've been working on, uh, and I hope that's going well for you. I hope you're engaging with that. And again, I, I'm a little bit anxious. We sort of float something out there, and away it goes. Uh, and Gary, you know what I'm talking about. Off he goes. Is he okay over there? I hope so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, but you let it out of the nest, and off it goes, and you hope it does well. But that's part of the nature of what we're doing with our marks of discipleship. If it is to be, it is up to me. That goes for each and every one of us. If it is to be, it's up to you. You get out of it what you put into it, uh, and then some because God blesses it. And so please uh, devote yourselves to them. Devote yourselves to them. And if the church calendar can be of any help, then great. I know some churches have abandoned the church calendar here altogether. And they don't really know much about that anymore. But I'm willing to keep something as long as it's useful. And I think that today, having a reminder that Christ is the King is a great reason to keep this Sunday alive. Christ the King Sunday. You've heard it said, uh, at least from this pulpit, that one of the theories of <coughs> understanding Jesus as Savior is that he was either a Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. You've heard that before. Hopefully you've heard it from here. And that is that either Jesus is who he says he is, or he's not telling us the truth, or he's deranged. Now, as people of faith, we believe that he is who he says he is. Because he says he's the Son of God, that he's God incarnate, and you have to either take him at his word or say, well, he's not telling you the truth, or he's messed up somehow. Well, there's another set of three that you can remember with Jesus, and maybe you've heard these before. Prophet, priest, and king. <laughs> That's interesting, there's lights in it now. Prophet, priest, and king. Have you heard those before? Uh, that's a description. Mostly that comes from the book of Hebrews. Uh, but all throughout the uh, New Testament you'll see descriptions of Christ as either a prophet, a priest, or a king. Now, we can't reduce it down and say that he's just one or the other. This isn't an exercise in reduction. How many of you know what, re what reductionism is? Right? Dietary reductionism is one of those things that uh, us organic-minded folks rail against. And that is because, with what I believe, that the whole food itself, the whole leaf of spinach, has more nutrient value in it itself, just as it is, than any uh, vitamin tablet you can take. Because what we do is we say that, uh, well, it's got iron in it, and iron is a good thing, so we're going to manufacture our own iron supplement and give it to you because the food doesn't have the same amount. So we're going to reduce it down. Why does orange juice need calcium? Anyone? Um, oranges actually have a little bit in them. So why do we add calcium to orange juice? Because we think that, well, we just need the basic elements. As long as I get these vitamins, check those off. Right? We could reduce it down. 
But we do the same thing with our faith, too. But I said, be careful with the marketing discipleship that it doesn't become a checklist. All right, and this, 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 this. Yep, we're good for today. Now I can go back to the, being the rowdy, rambunctious sinner that I was before. <laughs> now you can't escape from being that, so you might as well dive into the marks all the time. That's what we get today. Is we get the temptation to reduce Christ down to a king. What is a king? <coughs> Do we even need a king? Well, we have a president. We have Congress. And we have other folks that are up above us, governors and leaders and so on. We don't have a king. And even the Brits who have a king, or a queen in this case, uh, even they're sort of arguing and wondering, should we change the rules? Should we still have a king? Do, do we let the next one be king? Or do we change it so that the girl can be king? Because, or queen, because she likes the girl as well. You know, there's a whole royal mess going on over there in England, but even they have a parliament and other people that make rules. Now, the idea of a king is not something that's part of our everyday language. Uh, we're not that familiar with this king idea. If, if anything, it's what we get from movies and television, or what we play as kids. Sometimes kids play, you know, I get to be the king, or I'm king of the mountain. Now, that's a lot of fun. A nice big hill of wood chips or something. And someone stands on the top of it, and you try and push each other off. How many of you got your first broken arm playing king of the mountain? <laughs> you know, for us, the idea of a king uh, is a position of power to be defended, a position of authority to be wielded, or um, Mad King George, was the film that came out recently, the idea of a king or a queen, or what was the king's speech. The idea of a king is popular in our minds as some sort of fanciful thing along with princes and dragons and wizards and that kind of stuff. So how does Christ the king remain relevant? How do we see Jesus as king? Well, that also has to do with authority. The real authority. That also has to do with sovereignty. The idea that this is a king over all things. That there isn't anywhere that isn't under this king's reign. It has to do with the kingdom of God. The phrase that is used for the kingdom of God is the Malkuth Shemayim. That's the Aramaic for kingdom of God, and that means the reigning of God. It's not a physical place, but it's a time in which God's reign is occurring. The king is inaugurated and sits on the throne. The reign begins, and whatever rules that king makes are enacted from that day forward. That's the kind of idea. And so it's the kingdom of God. It's really the reigning of God. When we see God's reign begin, we will begin to see the kind of changes that God wants to see in the world take place. So the real question to ask is, when we think of Jesus as a king, what does that reign look like? What does this king's kingdom look like? So let's focus not so much on the king for the moment. We'll come back to the king, and let's look at the kingdom. Because we have a really a description of how the king is going to administer justice as in this kingdom from our, our tale today. From the story that we have here, we'll see when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he'll sit on the throne. There's kingly language right there. There's the king and his court and the throne. The Son of Man comes, all the angels with him, will sit on the throne of his glory. I mean, that's going to be an amazing moment, isn't it? Think about that. All the nations will be gathered before him. There's that idea of sovereignty of God. Everything is covered. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another. I wish it had stopped right there. I really do. Because what comes next throws off more folks and causes more tribulation, I think, than, than good. And that is the business of the sheep and the goats. Uh, how many of you have heard sermons about, uh, well, sheep are really like this, and goats are really like that, and good people are more like sheep, and bad people are more like goats, because sheep are this way, and goats are that way. Have you heard that kind of sermon before? Where most of it's fixated on sheep or goats? Okay, don't, don't fixate on sheep or goats. Focus instead on what's happening here, on the, the reign of God, and what the kingdom of God looks like. We'll get, back, we'll get, we'll get back to the administration of justice. Let's get past the sheep and the goats. But that's how he's going to separate people. Suffice it to say, there will be a separation. Some on this side and some on that side. 
sheep on one side, goats on the left. The king will say to those that is right, sheep, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What does Jesus expect will have taken place in his kingdom? That's what's coming next. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. These are activities that take place in the kingdom of God. During God's reign, these are the things that would have been happening. Because the king at this point is speaking in the past tense, isn't he? not saying, you're going to do these things. He's saying, you did them. You've done them. Now the king is just showing up on his throne. That means the kingdom of God is happening before the king comes. That's part of the breaking in of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was inaugurated there. Jesus died, buried three days later, was raised, 40 days later, was ascended into heaven, and is, as we confess in the creed, seated at the right hand of God. Yeah, there's the throne idea, seated there with God, and will come again to judge. Here's the coming again to judge part. This is part of the kingdom happening in between that time and this time. Between the time of that cross happening and the time that he comes back. Now I'm not going to break it down into different sections and different monuments and different comings and all this stuff. And I'm not going to get a big whiteboard and do all that for you. Suffice it to say, again, reduce this down with me, that between then and here, the kingdom is breaking in. And this is what Jesus expects it to look like. Expects it to look like this. There is an expectation that people will be doing these things. To him. And he goes on to explain that just as you did it to the least of these, uh, that if he considers his family, then you've done it to him. See, this story does a few things for us. It reminds us that we aren't in charge. We'll get to that. It reminds us of who, who is in charge and what he expected to look like. But it also begins to point us to Advent. Get back into the church calendar idea. This text begins to point us into Advent. How so, you might say? We'll give you two Christmas ideas, two Advent ideas. One of them from more pop culture, and the other one uh, from uh, our hymnody, from our scripture. We have the shepherds out in the field at night, watching their flocks, and the heavenly chorus shows up, and what do they tell the shepherds? Don't be afraid, for I give you... Great tidings, the good tidings of great joy. Just as Linus says every year. Yeah. <laughs> the Charlie Brown special. <laughs> he tells them about the birth of the Savior. And what's the phrase that we sing? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. On whom God has favor. Get in the scriptures and look at it. There, Jesus is setting it up back then. God has an idea that there's going to be peace coming. Goodwill to all, which means this kind of kingdom stuff is going to happen. I mean, it's nice, you know, hey, how you doing? That's goodwill. Yeah? No, that's political glad-handing. Goodwill looks like this. It's not enough to, as the scriptures remind us, say, peace. Go in peace. Feel good about yourself if your belly is growling and if you don't have a home to go to. That's not enough. This is what goodwill looks like. And so when the angel showed up and said, this is what's going to happen, and the angel showed up with Mary and said, Mary, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have a child. And Mary said, yeah. My soul magnified the Lord. And she listed off these wonderful things that are going to occur in her Magnificat. That the rich will be cast down from their anyone thrones. There's a kingly image. Will be sent away empty. But the poor will be lifted up and they will be fed. This is pointing us to Advent. It's a bit like foreshadowing. Of course, that's the cyclical nature of the church here. You know, it comes around again. 
But it's almost as if Jesus is saying to these folks gathered here, do you remember then? Do you remember when I was a baby, when I wasn't even born yet? On the day that I was born, on the night that it happened, those angels showed up and they told you what it was going to be like. And do you remember the words that Mary said, that the world is going to change and that it's going to start to look different and people are going to care for one another? Do you remember that? Now it's time to cash in those chips. Now it's time to bring that into its fullness. Now it's time to make that kingdom its full reality. To some, it's as if Jesus was saying, See, I told you it was going to get better. Those who have done these things. And to others, it's as if Jesus has said, I've warned you. It's the judgment part. And that's what's hard for us. We look at this and we think, well, what does it mean to be a sheep? Or what does it mean to be a goat? You know why I think folks get anxious about that? So that we'll know whether we're a sheep or a goat. <laughs> Spend a lot of time looking up shepherds and you know, finding out, what, well, how do shepherds treat their sheep? And what makes a sheep different from a goat? And, and uh, don't be anxious. There's an easy way. Do the things that Jesus is asking you to do. It's easy. Simple. Some of you have already been doing it. Like I said, I gained a pound and a half. Thank you very much for all the food that you gave me to take care of us while Christy was sick. I mean, yeah, I can cook, but boy, I can eat too. <laughs> well, it's not just that these things happen. It's that we do them. That we do them. Notice Jesus does not say, for I was hungry and a food bank fed me. I was thirsty, and, well, I found some water somewhere. I was naked and bought some clothes at a thrift store. I was sick, and you sent a pastor to see me. I was in prison, and you started a prison ministry. Not what Jesus says. Those things are good. But this is for each of us. The you is directed at each one of us. You did these things. You make these things happen. And when was it that we did those things? And the king will answer them, just as you did at least one of these, or members of my family did it to me. This tells us about God's intention. God intends for us to do this. We get another clue into the king's authority as well. I said I would come back to that. And this is what the kingdom is going to look like, but this is the authority that the king has. There's also good news in this. Look with me and, and see the difference. Um, let's see if I can point out the verse for you here. And it's verse 34. The king will say to those at his right hand, Come you that are blessed by my father, and hear it what? The kingdom. The kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So those on the right go to the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. We know that Jesus... We were reminded in John that he was there, that nothing was created apart from him. He was there at the moment of creation. And so we see here that this is when that kingdom was prepared, way back when. Come now into that kingdom. We like to think of that as heaven, okay? Now look what the other team gets. We see further down, um, and you who are accursed, in verse 41. He will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, not prepared for you, but prepared for the devil and his angels. So, if you are setting up something beforehand, let's say preparing dinner for your family, and you lovingly prepare the meal, you set the table and you set the meal out, and you call them to dinner. You've prepared that beforehand. You've set that all up. That's your intention. But they come in and come to the dinner table all day in bags from McDonald's. How does that make you feel? What do you say? Throw that stuff away and eat this food? No, you don't want to waste food. You already spent the money on that. You can call that food. They bring this in and they... I don't know about you, but I would feel a little offended. Yeah, I went all this trouble to make this meal for you, and this is how you repay me. You 
decide to go out and get fast food, especially if they knew that you were fixing their favorite thing. Now, I'm not giving you a story of what actually happened in our household. Don't think that. <laughs> no, I prefer things, and sometimes the kids won't eat them, but hey, that's life. Just for example, though, think about it. God's intention here was that the place prepared for them was the good place. He intends us to go into the kingdom prepared for him. But as a matter of consequence, well, if you didn't carry these things out, then there is this other place. It was prepared for Satan and his angels, but I suppose you can be there too. There's the good news in the text still. That God's intention is for us to be in his kingdom. God desires that more than anything else. This is the kind of king he is. We see another popular king, the story steering us towards Advent. <laughs> How many of you know that? Good king. Wenceslas, right? What kind of king was Wenceslas? Good kind, right? Good king Wenceslas went out on the feast of Stephen for uh, where the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even. Goes out, and what happens to Wenceslas? Finds a, a beggar seeking winter fuel. He's a good king. He does the right thing. So we do have some ideas about kings in our culture that are appropriate. But we need to look at this example first. God desires that we live in his kingdom, but he desires that we take care of others, and that we do so according to these things. That he does have the authority to come again and decide whether or not we have held up this end of the bargain. Now, questions of salvation you might have. Well, what about those who call in the name of the Lord? What about the thief on the cross? What about, what about, what about? I don't know. This is a kingdom story. This is for us right now. This is the kind of tale, like the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man who's down in hell, and the Lazarus who's up in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man says, send Lazarus down that he might dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. That's a cautionary tale. That's what we get. It's like Dante's Inferno and so many others before it that warn us, hey, look out. You don't want to end up where you don't want to end up. Instead, you want to follow what God has for you to do. Because when you do, you inherit the kingdom that he's prepared. Don't worry about whether or not you are a sheep or a goat or what those things are like. Follow the king. Follow the king. These aren't hard things. What do we ask us to do? Simple things. I tell you, I, I made sure before I went on our little uh, vacation, if you can call it that, um, to take care of my wife, that uh, I went out to see Hans. I got to see Bernice uh, before she died. And when I sat down with Hans to visit with him, it's always enjoyable. He's fading away, skinny as a rail, but he's still sharp. I'm glad to hear from others uh, how many people in our congregation are going to visit that man. Pastor Art is going to see him regularly, taking care of the business that is here. Because from his perspective, well, there's a reason why God wants us to do this stuff. When he moved into the Regency Center that he's in now, I came to see him shortly after he was there. And he said, well, this is a nicer place. Doesn't, just, to be honest, it doesn't smell as bad as the place you were in before. He said, yeah, it's still a nursing home. I got to get up and walk away, get in my car and drive home to see my family. He stayed right there. The reason God wants us to do these things not so that he can have us show up at the end of days and say, well, yep, you did it over here, you did it over there. But because there's a reason for them, because God loves his people and wants us, his hands and his feet, to care for his people.